Professor Peter A. Victor from the Faculty of Environmental Studies of York University. Il nous parlera entre autres de la place qu'occupe la croissance économique dans la gestion des instances publiques versus les impacts que celles-ci occasionnent sur l'environnement ou l'emploi. Good morning everyone. I want to thank the organizers for inviting me to speak to you today and uh, what I'm going to talk about is what I consider the big picture. Um, I'm an economist and for the last number of years focus of my work has been on this question of economic growth. Uh, why do we rely on it so much? Can we manage without it? Has it really served our purposes and so on? So that's really going to be what I'm going to be talking to you about this morning. Uh, towards the end of my remarks I will say something more specifically about cities. Um, so it's the big picture that we're going to hear about and uh, here's one big picture. This is a, a rather lovely graphic of our planet showing uh, biomass in full bloom uh, in, the, in summer across the various continents. Um, but as I say, I'm an economist and I envy people who talk about economy and environment, but from the environment perspective, because this is the kind of graphic that they're used to. But if any of you have ever studied economics or opened an economics textbook, you will have seen something like this. And this is what economists start with to try to understand how an economy functions. And it shows how firms and households interact by buying and selling the goods and services and the land, labor, and capital. Uh, we can make it move like this to show it's a cycle. Now, the problem with this, although it may be useful for understanding an economy in a limited way, um, it says nothing about the relationship between the economy and the environment. So we need to add in some of the important pieces that are missing. Well, let's start with the resources that are continually required to keep an economy going. These resources consist of all the materials and also the energy that are brought in, and now in modern parlance, the ecosystem, goods and services. But what physics teaches us is that all of the material and energy that enters into an economy is ultimately disposed of as waste. Most of it, by the way, leaves within a year. Very little is actually accumulated in physical terms in an economy. We've got problems now in two respects in our modern economies. We're overusing the environment uh, as a source of materials and energy, and we're overusing its capacity to absorb our wastes. So what's happening is that we're disturbing a number of the important biophysical cycles that characterize the planet to our detriment. Now, all that you're seeing before you is taking place on planet Earth. The only thing that any consequence that's leaving and, uh, and, uh, arriving and leaving the planet is energy. So this is how I think we need to understand an economy and ultimately a city as entities that thrive on and rely on a continual throughput of material and energy and worry very much about where we get these materials and energy from, the damage we do to the environment in doing that, and then, of course, the disposal problem. So now let's look at some data. This is a graph which shows you the global extraction of materials going back to the start of the previous century, 1900, all the way virtually to the present day. And if you look at what happened in the first half of the 20th century, you can see that there was a gradual, steady increase in the use of materials. And by the way, this includes fossil fuels, so uh, it includes energy as well in that respect, uh, over that half century. And then look at the second half. an absolutely massive increase in the exploitation of nature for supplying us with the materials and energy that we need in order to run our economies. It's not a surprise, therefore, that with this massive increase in, in material use, that we're seeing a whole variety of problems now showing up, not just at the local level, as we're, we're kind of used to in, in, in a country like Canada dealing with, but at the global level. Uh, I won't read them all, but you can see at the top we've got climate change, ocean acidification, uh, stratospheric ozone depletion. But the three which stand out are those where you see that bright red, those bright red sort of pie slices. In the center of this picture is, uh, is what you could consider the safe operating space of humanity. But with respect to climate change, uh, the sulfur cycle, I said, no, sorry, the nitrogen cycle and biodiversity loss, uh, it's pretty clear that we've now exceeded the capacity of the biosphere to support what we're doing, and we're pushing outwards with respect to the others as well. A very similar story comes from uh, a diagram which I'm sure is familiar to most of you, where we look at the ecological footprint of, uh, of, of humans on the planet, going back to 1961 all the way to 2005, and uh, the, the horizontal line there represents the capacity of the planet to supply us with all of our biologically-based um, uh, inputs. 
And sometime in the, in the 80s, um, what this work suggests is that we began to exceed the capacity of the planet to provide us uh, with biologically derived inputs. And so now we're into this period of overshoot and depleting natural capital. It tells a very similar story to the picture I showed you a moment ago. Just to bring this a little bit closer to home, um, here's what happened uh, off the east coast of Canada. This graph also goes back fair, a fair way in time to 1850. You can see that up until about 1960, there was just a slow and steady increase in the catch of Atlantic cod. And then came new technology. And I, I emphasize that because so many people today think the answer to our problems is new technology. We, we have some experience. Here's the new technology that came in the 60s. Here's what happened to the fish catch. Big increase in efficiency in terms of fish caught per dollar invested, but of course the fishery couldn't stand it and it collapsed. If we look at the history of fossil fuels, because it's the uh, availability of cheap fossil fuel that has allowed us to have the kind of economy that we have and the kind of cities that we have. This is a graph that goes back 2,000 years. Well, there wasn't much action for the first part, and then boom, look what happens. Uh, the last uh, 10 generations of people in Western countries at most have experienced economic growth and it's been driven fundamentally by access to cheap fossil fuel. The composition of the fossil fuels has changed. It was much more dependent on coal than it is now. Now it's more oil and, and gas, but the, 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 the basic story is a pretty simple one to see. Well, of course, there's a lot of concern now that we don't have uh, access anymore to cheap supplies of, uh, of oil in particular. And that concern is now being expressed in, in, in very official quarters. So here's uh, uh, Dr. Burrell of the International Energy S uh, Agency uh, saying that uh, even in his estimation, uh, we'd see the output of conventional oil peaking by 2020. There are many commentators who say that uh, it's happening now, and if it's not happening now, it'll happen before 2020. Very few put the date past that point. One of the best scholars on this question of the relationship between cheap energy and its relationship to economic growth is Robert Ayers, who wrote this wonderful book called The Economic Growth Engine, which I recommend to you all. And I'm just going to give you one quote from the book. Looking into the future, he says, although highly uncertain, the most probable forecast for US gross domestic product is one in which growth ceases sometime between 2030 and 2040. Now, he's not saying necessarily he'd like that to happen. He's saying it's likely to happen, although he is clear that it's uncertain. It could happen before then, uh, or it could happen after that. But it's this connection between uh, cheap energy and growth which has been fundamental to us in the past, and I think that era is rapidly coming to an end. Well, can we rely on technology to get us through this? Well, technology, I'm sure, will be helpful, has been very helpful, but it won't be sufficient. And I'll give you a, f a few reasons for why I say that. Here's a quick pictorial history of the computer. That's what a computer looked like the year I was born. Uh, it took a lot of people dressed in very formal clothing to run a big room full of equipment to do a few what we would now consider fairly simple sums. By the time I did my doctorate in economics, uh, it was the world's in color, and one person seemed to be able to run the show. By 1993, which is the year that students now coming into universities were born, uh, that's what a computer typically looked like. And today, of course, we see things like this. So this is actually incredible progress. I don't deny that for a moment. And it's an example of miniaturization. Now, there's a tendency to think that miniaturization reduces the impact on the environment. But it's miniaturization that's allowed something like this to be built. You couldn't design this without a computer. You couldn't build it without a computer. And you couldn't operate it without a computer. And I say the same about this kind of equipment. Look at this. A truck so big, it needs a staircase to get to the driving seat. Um, it's used, of course, to move massive quantities of material. It's all part of the same story that I'm, that I'm telling you here. And now here's a cityscape, a pretty normal-looking cityscape, and then they added this. And again, it's miniaturization that's made this kind of technology possible. This is a particular example, if you like, of the rebound effect, something else which we now have to tackle. The rebound effect works as follows. If you make that car that you see in the picture more efficient, you may have an expectation that energy use will go down. But it's not as simple as that. If you have a more efficient car, the costs of running it are reduced as compared with a less efficient car. People tend to drive further if the costs go down, and in, that, in doing so, they use more energy. But that's only one part of the rebound effect. 
depending on the technology, it may in fact take more energy to produce the energy efficient car in the first place, if you just think of all the energy that goes into the uh, production of a battery, for example. But let's acknowledge that an energy efficient car will save the user some money. The next question is, what do they do with the money that's been saved? Well, if like the person who this diagram was drawn for gets on a plane and goes for a holiday in Spain, you can imagine the overall energy impact of the increase in technology efficiency or technological efficiency is not all positive. In fact, there are cases where uh, there's been no saving in energy at all. So the conclusion I draw is that we have to address the scale of our economy and our economic activities as well as the efficiency of those activities or the intensity. They're very similar concepts. Again, I'll show you some data. This is 1980 to 2005. Everything here is indexed to 100. And what this shows is that over that period, you can see the thick blue line in the middle, primary energy use worldwide increased by nearly 60%. But energy intensity, the energy required per dollar of economic output, declined over that period. In some sense, we became more efficient. But the increase in efficiency or the reduction in intensity was slower than the increase in the scale of the economy. The GDP worldwide grew 110%. So you see that this increase in scale is overwhelming and has been overwhelming the improvements in efficiency. So the key message on that particular diagram is that environmental impact, and this is a very general statement that I'd be glad to stand by, depends upon the scale of the activity that causes the impact and the intensity with which the impact is caused. Well, now, there are many questioning growth. I'm certainly not the only one, and it's now getting quite crowded, I'm glad to say. Uh, here's some uh, clippings from the press. I won't read them out, but you can see they all deal with this question of can we manage without growth, or is growth coming to an end? There's even the Wall Street Journal saying new limits to growth revive Malthusian fears. Paul Krugman running out of planet to exploit. There's the new scientist with the whole issue on the folly of growth, and so on. The Guardian in England, Christian Science Monitor, Toronto Star, contemplating life without growth. Uh, here's Der Spiegel, can economists function without growth? Even The Economist, progress and its perils. Uh, many of us are writing books. There's just one I picked at random. Um, uh, there's a report to the, uh, to the British government, Prosperity Without Growth. It's now been rewritten as a book, a very great, good book by Tim Jackson. Uh, his Growth Isn't Possible from the New Economics Foundation. His fa it's on Facebook now, the uh, Center for the Advancement of a Steady State Economy in the U.S. Here's the second international degrowth conference. We're going to have a major degrowth conference here in Montreal next year. And here's time, the national natural debt crisis, learning to live without, within our planet's means. Now, I want to emphasize this. When I'm talking about managing without growth, my own interest, and where I would put the priority is with rich countries like these, like this one that we're in now. If you look at this um, group of photographs, this is a week's food consumption in four different countries, and it illustrates the incredible uh, inequality that describes our world today. The top left-hand corner uh, is a European family looking at a week's food supply for four people. And then on the top right, we have an Ecuadorian family. The bottom left, we have a, a family in Bhutan, and the bottom right in Chad. And, and you can just see the, the, the massive in, in inequality uh, represented by this picture. Uh, by the way, now this isn't science, but I can't help pointing it out to you. There's only one family that's not smiling, and that's the family looking at that monstrous amount of food and drink they're planning to consume. So what I've done in some of my analytical work is to ask the following question. Can we have full employment, no poverty, fiscal balance, and reduce significantly our greenhouse gas emissions without relying on economic growth? And to get some insight into that, I developed a, a simulation model of the Canadian economy, which I call low grow because it's designed specifically to look at low and no and ultimately degrowth scenarios. Well, the answer to the question, according to the computer, is yes, we can do it. And I think this is an important message because I think there's a real concern that we have to have growth, as Jeff said in his introduction, otherwise it's a catastrophe. I think I'm going to try, what I'm going to try and do now is to suggest uh, a different answer. Well, now here's what the model suggests would happen in Canada if the 25 or 30 years from 2005 onwards was to look pretty much like the, the period before that. Everything indexed to 100 for ease of comparison. 
This model is a long-term model. It doesn't deal with the sort of the season to season, quarter to quarter, ups and downs. And what this says is if we were to a able to stay on track, and of course we've had this major recession which has already pushed us off it, but current policy right now is to get us back onto something like this, what would happen? Well, GDP, GDP per person would just about double over the next 30 years. Unemployment goes up, comes down again, doesn't do very much. Greenhouse gases, uh, rise significantly, not as much as GDP per capita because we can expect some efficiency gains. The government's debt to GDP ratio uh, would, would continue to decline. But one of the shocking things about this scenario is if you look at that brown line in the middle, the poverty line, that's the UN's poverty index, by the way, a, a composite measure of a number of variables, it would rise over that period. In other words, we'd have more poor Canadians at the end of this continued 30 years of economic growth, business as usual, than we have right now. Well, many people, as I say, are asking whether there's an alternative. Here's an example. This is a quite well-known uh, economic writer in the Guardian Weekly in Britain asking whether it's possible to challenge the growth at any cost model and come up with an alternative that is environmentally benign, economically robust, and politically feasible. Well, here's such a scenario. And this doesn't happen automatically. To make the Canadian economy look anything like this requires a number of interventions, which I will describe in a moment. But let me just describe this, um, this scenario to you. You can see that uh, gross domestic product per capita has leveled off towards the end of the scenario. This comes about through a number of changes that I introduced starting in 2010. Uh, unemployment has come way down, lower than it's been for 50 years in this country. Greenhouse gas emissions have dropped significantly. The human poverty index has come way down, would be the lowest in the world. And still the government's debt to GDP ratio uh, declines and levels off in a very acceptable way. Well, how does that happen? Well, it's a big story and I can only quickly go through some of the major uh, changes that we would have to see. It's very important, I think, for us to revisit what we mean by success at the global, national, community, and individual level. Uh, rising GDP per capita is not an adequate measure. We need fewer status goods. Uh, at the moment, we strive for status very much by uh, buying things. That's, not, that's, that's somehow got to change, and we can talk about what we might have to do to rein in advertising to bring that about. For the reasons I've sort of intimated up to now, we need much stricter limits on the extent to which we keep extracting materials and energy from nature and returning waste, and we've got to discipline our use of land. Uh, in this particular scenario you're looking at, uh, the population has become stable, and so has the labor force. The main instrument in which, uh, that brings that, the greenhouse gas emissions down is a carbon tax that's in this model, and that would generate more informative prices throughout the economy because ultimately everything is one way or another dependent on carbon. We definitely need a more efficient capital stock, uh, urban infrastructure, uh, private goods, and so on. Uh, unemployment is reduced in the model because it's assumed that the increase in productivity that we would still benefit from over the next 30 years we would take out in terms of more leisure time rather than more product. And to deal with uh, poverty, uh, the uh, scenario assumes more generous anti-poverty programs because of the failure of trickle-down. And finally, in my own sphere, we need to be sure that we're educating students for life, not just for a job. So I want to say something about cities now. This uh, comes from Scientific American, 1965. Uh, it was one of the few articles that I reviewed when I was uh, doing my, my, my doctorate uh, that really saw cities in the way that I was trying to understand economies as embedded in the natural environment. Now, I haven't studied cities very much since then, but I assume that when I went back to the literature in preparation for this meeting, there'd be a whole load of studies which had built upon these ideas from 65. And I'm sad, sorry to say that doesn't seem to be the case. There are some, and I'm just going to mention them quickly in passing. This is a paper by Newman in 1999 where he, he, uh, he acknowledges that 1965 study. And you can see very clearly the, the image that he's developing here. You've got the resource inputs. You've got the dynamics of the settlements, which will determine the resource requirements. The resources ultimately end as waste outputs. But, but at the same time, if we've used the, the resources well, then the livability of the city will be promoted. And he takes that idea and expands on it in the article. 
Uh, here's an actual estimate for Sydney, Austria, Australia, uh, which shows uh, estimates of various kinds of materials and energy sucked into Sydney in 1990, gives the population as well, and then the waste products that are produced. I mean, th there's a sort of a nice materials balance calculation that you can do for cities, as you can for economies, uh, which we generally don't do, but this is an example of an, of, of an attempt to do that. Uh, here's a comparative study. It includes uh, the GTA, where I live, and uh, shows, again, the same model, materials here, here, water is highlighted, energy coming in and waste going out, uh, and compared with Hong Kong on a per capita basis, and generally speaking, uh, Hong Kong looks a little more efficient than the GTA. And the final study I'll mention, now these diagrams can get a bit like a spaghetti diagram, but this is a particularly interesting paper, and the reference is up there, because it, it's tried to give a complete energy budget for Rome in all respects, energy that is accessed by the city uh, that doesn't go through the market as well as commercially supplied energy. And then there's a, con uh, a, a, um, a comparison, and the, the author uses the term energy rather than energy for reasons I can answer in question time, but uh, it's essentially energy, and uh, you can see how there are two other cities there which on a per capita basis are much more efficient than Rome. Now. Just to return to the theme of what can happen to cities if we find that we're no longer in an era of cheap oil, there are commentators like uh, this gentleman who believe that, quite rightly, I think suburbia was built because of cheap oil and it will likely die if oil is no longer cheap. Now, I've stuck pretty close to my theme throughout, but I decided for this uh, talk I would introduce one more diagram, I uh, hope it's the next one that comes up, that uh, seems to have nothing to do with cities. This is a very famous map, many of you may have seen it, and it describes Napoleon's march on Moscow. Mm -hmm. What's that got to do with cities? Well, it tells a very interesting story. First of all, this is a, um, uh, was described by Edward Tuft as, as, as possibly the best um, graphical image ever uh, for presenting data, so that's something to think about. There's a map there of the, uh, of, of the terrain between France and Moscow, and the beige line, which starts very thick on the left-hand side, represents the size of the army that left France, 440,000 people. And you can see how it shrunk as it made its way to Moscow, and then the black line shows it coming in the reverse direction until it ended up uh, sometime later with only 10,000 survivors. Now, the main reason why the uh, French forces were, were reduced uh, in this very significant way, well, for two reasons. One is the Russians destroyed the food supply for the French, so as they moved towards Russia, there was no food to eat. And the second was they didn't anticipate the extremes of weather and were not prepared for it. And so both of those factors uh, did a really serious damage to, to, the, to the French army. I've always thought that we ought to be thinking about cities in, some, in, in, in much the same way that, that military commanders try to plan for military camp campaigns, where you think very carefully about supply lines and about the conditions under which you're operating. And I believe that there's some there, therefore some lessons to be learned when we talk about the eco-city, even from something like this. So my final words. Can we make the changes that I think that um, a deliberate or or non-chosen end of economic growth will uh, oblige us to, to undertake. And um, it's hard to be optimistic, but one tries. It's hard to be optimistic because what we really need to do is to change the way our institutions function. And that is not a simple matter. It involves massive changes in, in, in the business world, in government. Uh, I've got religious institution there, banking, global institutions, and so on. And uh, these are institutions which characteristically change slowly, tend these days to be rather short-term in their thinking when a longer-term view is required. But if we don't make the changes that I'm sure will be high on the agenda and many of the discussions we'll have at this conference, then I'm afraid I think we're looking at a very bleak future with big thunderclouds ahead. But I don't think that's the only future. I think if we're thoughtful about it and we try very hard to understand the predicament we're in and look at the options for getting out of it, that there is a much brighter future awaiting us. And that's the image that I wish to leave you with. Thank you very much.